Okay, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program on fighting inequality. My name is Ken Inadomi. I am the chair of YANA, the Yale Alumni Nonprofit Alliance. Of course, many people feel that YANA more accurately stands for you are not alone. And if you look at the crowd we have tonight, you'll see why. YANA really is about building community. It's about building community among Yale alumni, friends, and family who are really dedicated toward making the world a better place. There are about 6,000 followers of YANA now. We passed the 6,000 threshold this year. Great. But we barely scratched the surface, and here's why. Let me start with this, give you one data point. There are over 170,000 Yale alums globally, and we estimate that two out of three are somehow involved in social impact or nonprofit, whether as executive directors, volunteers, board members. But if you do the math on that, that's still a group of over 100,000, and we only have 6,000. And really, the, 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 the mission, the stated mission of YANA is to connect and to catalyze Yale's social purpose community for the greater good. So thank you for coming tonight. This is very, very excited uh, for tonight's program. How are we, just a couple examples of how YANA actually pursues its mission. Three examples. One is the YANA Dwight Hall Fellowship. Dwight Hall is a nonprofit that's located on campus that focuses on social justice and public service issues. We're providing scholarships or fellowships for Yale students that are under-resourced who are working in nonprofit internships. A second example is the YANA Global Webinar Series, in which each month we provide one hour of programming, again, broadcast globally, um, to, that provides the most recent and most relevant social impact topics for uh, nonprofit leaders today. And a third example is the YANA chapters, the regional chapters. It's a network nationwide of, that allows like-minded and mission-driven alums to get together to support each other, whether you're in Texas, the Bay Area, DC, Denver, Seattle, New England, eight chapters total. If you're interested in YANA, if you'd like to get engaged for those of you first timers, or if you'd like to even explore becoming a supporting member, which sustains our work and mission, uh, please look at our website, contact me personally, or contact uh, Rachel Littman, our executive director who's here today. Rachel, you want to stand up? Okay, up there, thank you. Okay, so before we introduce the panel, we have to give a shout out to our hosts here at the Lycée. Is Pascal Bichard here? Okay, the Lycée has been so gracious every time we have a big event like this. I mean, how can you turn down access to a magnificent facility? So how about a big hand for our friends at the Lycée? <laughs> And second, I've got to give a hat tip to a YANA board member and our events and programming chair, Grace Shia. Uh, it's pretty self-evident that no one can produce and host an event like Grace. So how about a big hand for Grace? Okay. So I mentioned there are 100,000 alums approximately that are involved in social impact. And we have four luminaries from that group tonight. Don Chen, Hillary Pennington, Mariko Silver, and Maxim Thorne. Um, Stuart Hudson, who had been scheduled to be our moderator, a family issue came up. His mother, 85 years old, took a fall, and naturally, Stuart is attending to her. But the Yana bench is so deep that I was able to give Maxim a call, and he graciously stepped up. I'm going to introduce Maxim, and then he'll introduce the rest of the panel. Maxim Thorne is currently the managing director at the Andrew Goodman Foundation, which is a nonprofit that focuses on uh, really fighting uh, voter suppression, which is such an important uh, uh, cause today. Great. <clears throat> In his previous professional roles, he was the senior vice president and the chief communications officer at the NAACP. And also, my favorite, is he taught an incredible course at Yale called Philanthropy in Action, one of the most popular courses, which really covered uh, uh, social investments. Um, so we, I can't think of a better, play, a better person uh, to fill in as our moderator than, than Maxim. So let me invite the panel to come up, and let's give a big hand for them, please.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, what Ken didn't tell you that this was all a bait and switch. Uh, Stuart is wonderful. And I wish his mom well, uh, but I don't think this panel knows what it's getting into. Uh, um, uh, to put you on notice, uh, there were prior conversations, none of which I participated in. Um, so uh, Ken was so gracious to email me the notes, copious notes, which I told him went to spam. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, You're saying we can say anything we want. You can say anything you want. <laughs> we are being recorded. It's okay, we don't really work in philanthropy. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it is really an honor uh, to be asked to do this. I, I, am, I am thrilled. Um, and I'm really thrilled because unlike the illustrious uh, folks on my left, um, I don't get the chance to often chat with people who collectively control more than several countries' GDP, right? You know, this is, you know, over 10 billion, more than that, right, Hillary? Um, and, you know, I was thinking, I was born in Guyana and grew up in the Bahamas, uh, and I think combined about all the Caribbean islands are less than two billion. Um, so that's a lot of power. So here are the powerful folks. Uh, my classmate, uh, class of 89, Don Chen, is now the president of the Cerdner Foundation, um, bringing all the good looks and charm uh, and talent to this, Don. I've never had an introduction like that before, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, and the fabulous Hillary Pennington. I actually tried to get her to talk to me about 10 years ago. Um, when, <laughs> it's true. Again, it's about power. By that time, she was even at a wealthier foundation uh, in Seattle. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it took me about a year to get about a five minute uh, conversation with her and she declined. Um, <laughs> But I don't hold that against you. I have three pages of questions uh, related to that. <laughs> and um, and she's, with the, she's the executive vice president of the Ford Foundation. And then, of course, uh, incomparable former president of Bennington College, and now the president of the Luce Foundation, Henry Luce Foundation, uh, Marika Silver. So I am totally intimidated. <laughs> So bear with me as I overcompensate. <clears throat> um, uh, so I mentioned that, uh, so when I was eight, we were living in the Bahamas. And for my eighth birthday, my father, who was alive, well, obviously, he took me to Abaco Island alone on a trip to spend with him for that birthday. And if anyone followed the news this year, the entire population has been evacuated from that island. Um, and the hurricane they experienced washed away everything that I can remember. Uh, and there's no one left uh, on that island. And I wondered, what did this island do to affect climate change? Nothing. And when we're talking about inequality and the role of philanthropy in inequality, there's so many ways uh, to think about that at a very personal level, um, about who will bear the brunt, for example, of the unequal power in creating the climate that we're suffering from and could, that could be worse. Um, and I was also thinking about growing up in Guyana, where I was born, and the only reason I could get to go to Yale is because I was able to study at the Carnegie Library um, and the JFK Library which were our libraries, um, and that my mom's family all got educated at the um, Carnegie School of Home Economics. Um, and the only reason that we didn't have hookworm, which was prevalent uh, in most of these countries, was because of the rubber slippers that came out of the experiments at the Rockefeller Foundation and, well, really the Rockefeller Foundation that prevented so many of us from, from dying early. Um, but, so part of this conversation, I think, is about um, 
wealth and power and the role of philanthropy in combating uh, uh, inequality. And I want to read one statistic that leads into my, my question. So the Census Bureau has been uh, studying income inequality since 1967. And in 1967, uh, uh, the GINI, GINI, it's what it's called, index was 0 0.397. So the way, the way this works is, if the score is zero, you're fully equal. If it's one, all the wealth is controlled by one person. So zero to one. Um, in 1967, the US was 0 0.397. In 2018, it climbed to 0 0.485. In comparison, no European nation has a score greater than 0 0.38. Um, so systemic inequality is actually starkest in the top tier of the economic ladder, which is populated primarily by white men. Women in the 95th percentile uh, earn about 68 cents on the dollar compared with their male counterparts. So Don and Hillary and Mariko, <laughs> given these fundamental flaws of epic scale, what are you doing? I mean, right now? <laughs> um, well, that's a great introduction. Um, and uh, I actually think it's great that you referenced uh, some of the founders of you know, some of the legacy foundations, I think, including all of ours. Uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Henry Luce, John Andrus. Um, and if you look at a lot of the, the founders of these foundations in the early part of the 20th century, many of them uh, went through the same thought process that, you're, that you've taken us through, which is um, how do you think about this broader social responsibility to take care of folks who, you know, uh, in Abaco um, had nothing to do with creating the conditions that just like utterly destroyed the island and how do we how do we develop programs to address those things? Um, our foundations have gone through many decades of change, and today uh, we address inequality through a couple of different ways. Primarily by understanding that uh, there are some foundations that have latitude uh, to address major issues, and we try to do it by looking at root causes. Uh, if you look at inequality, you know there are many ways of addressing it. You can do direct service. You can uh, you can do research, you can fund various things, um, and uh, the Cerdna Foundation and a lot of others really try to look at root causes in terms of our systems, our policies, our practices, uh, the rules of our economy uh, that really drive uh, the outcomes that we see today. Um, and if you compare the U.S. today compared to like 1967, was that it's the year I was born? I don't know if that's the year <laughs> you were born because we were in the same class. Um, but, you know, it's not that long ago. Um, how much have we changed as a society? I think the, the policies and the rules of our economy have changed significantly and have, um, have really skewed uh, outcomes uh, in the way that we see them today. So the way that we address them are a couplefold. Um, uh, we're a social justice foundation. That's how we define ourselves. And inequality really factors in as a uh, challenge of addressing disparities. And uh, one of the primary ways we address it is uh, looking at economic disparities. Uh, so wealth building, uh, creating wealth is one of our organizational outcomes. Uh, we do it through a variety of means, including supporting, for example, entrepreneurs of color and really trying to create ecosystems for uh, entrepreneurs who are normally frozen out of our, our, those opportunities, access to capital and whatnot, uh, and to try to create more opportunities for them to succeed. Uh, Another way in which we do that is uh, through our impact investing work, where we try to support uh, fund managers of color. Um, and again, this is a place where there's extreme inequality. Uh, if you look at the representation of folks who are fund managers in, you know, uh, uh, in, in, our, in this country, uh, I think it's something like less than 2% are either women or people of color, which is astounding. Less than 2% of fund managers, whether it's venture capital or whatnot, are pe women or people of color. And so what we try to do is really support uh, fund managers of, of, of color uh, and women uh, in our endowment mix. 
Um, so those are a couple of different ways, and just one more point on this to illustrate. Uh, we try to address inequality of voice and representation as well uh, through our arts and culture program and through other programs. So, uh, and again, trying to get at root causes uh, rather than just trying to ameliorate, ameliorate some of the, you know, some of the impacts and the outcomes that we see. That's primarily how we do it. Can you tell me, I want to uh, unmask wealth. Mm -hmm. How much is your endowment? Uh, it's over a billion, a mm. little bit over. Okay. And do you, at the end of your year, do you reinvest in your endowment? Uh, well, our, our endowment is continuously managed. Mm. Uh, we have an external uh, investment officer. Um, and uh, so, yeah, all the returns that we get from our investment income go back into the endowment. So you don't, mm -hmm. so it's your endowment grows every year? Uh, theoretically, it does, <laughs> except all when right. we have a bad year. We're going to come back to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary, tell us about the amazing things, that the, 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 basically the transformation that Darren and you and everyone else seems to be doing at the Ford Foundation. And Don, before you left us for certain. I know, that's right. Um, so Ford is an old foundation. We're over 80 years old. Um, and some of the changes we've made in, since 19, since uh, 2013 is to choose one focus and only one focus, which is inequality. And um, we've changed a lot as we do as we've done that, you know. And I think to your question, we have to be incredibly humble. You know, if you look at the issues that Ford has worked on through its 80-year history, we have not, and the world has not solved one of them, right? Poverty, improving education, better financial assets for the poor. So one of the things we've learned is that um, inequalities have a way of recreating themselves. And one of the things that we talked a lot about as we chose the focus was why is that? Like, what are the things that cause inequality to keep um, recreating itself. So when we speak of inequality, we don't just mean um, economic inequality, income inequality, um, but really all the things that drive inequality that, that interrelate with each other, right? So there's economic inequality, there's political inequality in terms of who controls access to um, government and decisions that get, get made by government. There are cultural inequalities in uh, the stories that are used to justify exclusion and um, othering. There's discrimination, just plain, straight up racism, uh, discrimination by race, by ability, by you know many, many, many ways. And there is also inequality in our failure to protect kind of public goods. So as we we chose that focus, we made some really hard decisions for an 80 year old foundation to move away from some areas that the foundation had funded for many many years that were practical things that make people's lives better every day. Things like education, financial assets, some work on housing. Uh, partly because there were lots of other new players coming into philanthropy, um, particularly recently wealthy people who are attracted to problems like that that require interventions or models or ways that you try to innovate and solve them. And we felt like we ought to focus on things that were harder, more root causes, so things like um, discrimination, like the criminal justice system. Uh, so we, um, we stopped doing some things so that we could start doing some new kinds of things. And three examples of that are um, a lot of work we're doing now on technology and society and all of the ways in which privacy and surveillance are challenging social justice and algorithms are being used to um, reinstate many old forms of discrimination and exclusion. Uh, the future of work and workers and um, climate change um, the way that we work on that is not so much about um, the environment. It is more um, really trying to stand with indigenous peoples who are the first defenders of climate and to give them more voice and more power in their own countries as negotiations happen about what gets extracted from their lands, but also globally. So when you, you know, I hope many of you saw all the protests that happened when Greta Thunberg was here, but there were also with her a lot of indigenous peoples. Those are grantees of the Ford Foundation that we are really lucky to get to support and learn from and, and link. So those are examples of things that we've done, not without controversy, it's, it's hard to change things when you're an institution that many um, organizations depend on. Um, and lots of other things to say, but. Hopefully, there'll be more of a chance yes. later. Uh, so, Marika, um, I'm going to frame this uh, in a way because you have a unique background, too. Um, and it allows me to get to Don, which is uh, you were president of, of Bennington. 
and you grew the endowment. Um, and you're now the president of Luce, which you told me earlier has about $900 million in its endowment. So I'm really puzzled um, about how you think about equality, inequality, in the context of being the president of a university and the president of a foundation. And so here is a problem that, that I'd like your thoughts on. Um, so many of America's higher education institutions, um, especially the wealthiest ones, and the ones with endowments like Yale, spend a significant an, uh, amount of time and money educating the most privileged people in America. And uh, Hillary, you talked about public goods. Yep. I think any philanthropic organization, uh, its assets are the public's good. The tax deduction uh, that, that help create these foundations and these universities um, prevented that money from going into the community chest, into local government coffers, state coffers, the, the federal government's coffers, so that these institutions could do the public good. I have a hard time understanding how the public good, uh, given that this, ta that this tax avoidance um, should be done for the people who are the most vulnerable Right, should be used. But in fact, Yale, for example, it's gotten better. Um, but you could say uh, Bowdoin, which hasn't, um, spends so much time educating the very wealthy. Uh, how, how in the context of, of dealing with inequality, uh, it, is that justifiable at the, at the college level? And is there a shift for you now that you are at a foundation? And the shift I want to ask you is, do you also increase your endowment at the foundation the way you increased your endowment when you were at Bennington? I love a passive moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple things I would say. So uh, just to give some context for the Luce Foundation, roughly three quarters of our grantees are in some way part of a higher education institution. Um, this is shifting. Uh, if you looked back a few years, you'd see more like 80%, 85%. I can talk a little bit about why that is, and it is explicitly related to inequality, though we are not, unlike uh, Ford and Cerdna, framed as a social justice or inequality-focused foundation. Um, and so one of the things that I do want to um, talk a little bit about is the ways in which foundations and philanthropy more broadly that is not necessarily explicitly social justice focused or is bound by donor intent. Um, that means that you can't uh, kind of undo the whole, undo the whole frame, uh, that you can actually embed that through your existing program areas. Um, can I just ask, and I will answer, get to your question, I'm not avoiding your question. Um, how many people in the audience are, are somehow in the philanthropic sector? Wow. And how many people are uh, grantees or recipients of philanthropic funds? Okay, so about half and half-ish. Um, uh, so I just, I just want to get a sense of the kinds of things that people would be most interested in. So to your question about higher education, and now I'm looking at that video camera, I had the great pleasure. <laughs> of uh, one of the, I had, a, I had a funny week, so I'm four months in uh, as president of the Henry Luce Foundation, so I know all the things. And uh, I had a, a funny week, sort of three or four weeks in, where I both got a, a very nice call from the headmaster of my high school, uh, which was a, a, a very wealthy high school, and he has now gone on to be on boards of many things, and also from uh, the president's office at Yale saying, I'd like to come see you, and I'd like to come see you. All right, so that was a moment for me. Um, and uh, I had, a, a, and I'm not going to uh, call him out, but I had a lovely conversation with President Salve, and one of the things that I talked to him about, and now I should say all the, pretty much all the looses went to Yale. There's a, some of you may remember, there are some buildings there named after various looses. Um, so we have a long connection, a uh, philanthropic connection to Yale, both through the family's individual philanthropy. It's no longer a family foundation, according to the generally accepted definition of family foundation, though there are some family members still involved uh, with the Luce Foundation on the board. And I knew that he was coming to see me the way that I, as a college president, would have come to see me, right, to talk both about uh, the history of our engagement together and some things he might be thinking about about the future. 
Um, but I also, in my role at Bennington, I think have been very public in talking about the ways in which uh, the scales need to be rebalanced with respect to access, equity, and inclusion, which are three different but related things, um, and also diversity, which is also different and related. Um, and um, I had an interesting conversation uh, with the Yale president about uh, equity of access to an undergraduate education in this case. The graduate conversation is a, is a separate one. Um, and Yale has done uh, some great work, also Princeton, in increasing their Pell eligible numbers. And my question Yale to is him, at the bottom so of this the is what I'm going to say, right? I'm yes. getting there, I'm getting there. Right? <laughs> so he was telling me about the good work that they have done. It's certainly very different from when I was there in that regard. And I said, how are you engaging with, with all of your, uh, not you, uh, Peter, but Yale's, all of Yale's great uh, status and prestige, how are you using that to lift up other institutions that have been serving north of 90% Pell eligible students for more years than I have been out of college? Mm -hmm. So to me, the question is both about money, and if I had a magic wand, uh, there are some things I would do in terms of well-resourced institutions and who they serve, and it's a mixed bag. Um, and it's also about prestige, status, and exposure. So where are the opportunities for those who are in positions of power because of resources to lift up the voices and the experiences and the expertise of those who are not in power because of resources? So, thank you. so I think that's an institutional imperative. So we're here, all here as Yale alums. I think, or many of us are Yale alums. I think that's an institutional imperative. I think that's a question we should all be asking of our established, well-resourced institutions to which we all have access. So only to say, and this is not to avoid the resource question, but the, re the financial resources are not the only lever. And I think we do the, the work the broader work that we all want to be engaged in, a disservice when we think of financial resources as the only lever. Um, having been the president of a, a small liberal arts college, and we, you know, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole necessarily in talking about Bennington, but where I was fundraising for the current use budget every single year to make sure that we could get our Pell numbers up, that we could uh, resource students appropriately when they arrived, and all of the things that go with that, to get a little bit of airtime is incredibly difficult. So one of the things that I am committed to now in my current role is both directly and through the leverage that we have with a number of others in our network, grantees and not, um, lifting up and bringing to the table, not as unicorn examples, mm -hmm. but as system change exemplars, others who are doing the work. Yes, we should also give them money when that is the right thing for the foundation that we, we in particular lead and fits with the philanthropic priorities. But just because we are limited, perhaps, in some cases, by the areas in which we are able to give, that doesn't mean that we are limited in the use of our voice. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Um, but note that we're all graduates in this room for the most part of one of the wealthiest institutions in the world that by definition, yeah, I'm not that passive, uh, <laughs> that by definition owes uh, its bounty uh, uh, to the common good and to doing the common good. And I think it, it, it is a mandate uh, that we should take on to hold institutions like Yale accountable to doing everything that you just said. Because until it radically changes the equation, with, with the access that Pell Grant recipients, um, the numbers of Pell Grant recipients uh, 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 would be represented, it is not fulfilling its duty. Um, so we have, so this conversation will take part, take place in three parts. This is section one, and you get a chance to now ask your questions as, for this part of the of, of, of tonight, and then we'll go to a second conversation and a third, and at the end of each section, you get a chance to also uh, engage in the conversation. Um, yes. And use your outside voice, please. Mm -hmm. 
In, in my previous life, when I was at the Gates Foundation, I led their higher education um, grant making, and we funded only community colleges for exactly that reason. They serve by far the most um, diverse population with the least resources, so they're a real engine of mobility. And then public universities are the second. You know, um, and Yale should be ashamed of itself, in my opinion. I don't give any money to Yale because it isn't. It is not living up to what it should do as a as a leading institution on these kinds of issues. Um, it should know better. One of the hardest calls I got in my early days at Ford was from a, a liberal arts education that wanted to know if Ford would fund its students to do leadership develop it, its American students to go overseas. She's looking at me, but it wasn't Bennington. It was It right. might have been actually your predecessor at Bennington. But anyway, to go, it was definitely not you. But to go to go overseas to learn, you know, to develop leadership and to understand what's happening. And and you know, you you think to yourself, why don't you focus on community? You know, community colleges are the world, um, and they get no. Uh, why do we need to send elite? students overseas. So I think we need to do both. Obviously, you, you, don't, you don't need to only do one thing. But I think it is a shame that elite institutions of higher education don't take more responsibility for the bigger ecosystem that they're part of and don't speak up more for where resources could go. Some institutions, Amherst is a great example, have done an amazing job. Almost all the transfers that they admit are, are um, community college transfers. Um, so Ford did, uh, for many, many years, do a lot of work with community colleges and others, and we don't um, so much anymore because we're not funding an education. Uh, but I love that question. I'll just say briefly, we've done some, uh, not in my view enough. Uh, our tendency has been to fund uh, research and scholarship, which does happen at community colleges, but there's a bias uh, towards our ones just in the overall ecosystem. And one of the questions that I always want us to be asking is, uh, first of all, how, are, how is what we're doing encouraging multi-layered, multi-time scale systems change? And I can talk more about what, that, what I mean by that. Um, and who are we not hearing from because we have not projected ourselves in such a way that they feel invited to come to us? We've done a much better job, frankly, at uh, direct outreach and engagement with HBCUs, minority-serving institutions more broadly, but four-year institutions, uh, particularly through our Claire Booth Loose program, which is limited to four-year institutions, which supports women in STEM. Um, and I'll just add that the Certain Foundation doesn't have a program on education or um uh, related opportunities, but it did in the in previous decades set up hundreds of scholarship you know, endowed scholarships all over the U.S., um, including Bennington and Yale and various other places. Um, but I think um, what this uh, makes me think of is the questions that you set up for us, which is, you know, is it the role of philanthropy to support the community college system in the United States? In some ways, you could you could say yes. You know, it's a public trust. Um, all of our endowments do uh, benefit from preferential tax treatment, and so yeah, it would be great if more foundations um, provided funding for community college education. But at the same time, uh, it begs this question: uh, it should be public responsibility, government funded, um, and that's when I think some of the foundations that do work on college access and, and higher education related issues um, can work on those root uh, causes related to policy change. Uh, the way budgets are dispersed and all those types of things. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's a very exciting time now uh, to see critics of the sector raise these questions to, uh, there are many, many books out there, there are many articles, there's more blogs, more commentators who are uh, raising the same questions, um, you know, basically calling our foundations uh, to task or at least really scrutinizing our sector more so than I can recall uh, during my time you know, as a grant seeker or as a philanthropist. So I think now is now's the right time to be placing these questions in the right context. Thank you. Yes. What's the scale of this? What's the scale of this score? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also, from an external source, um, what kind of revenue do you get from an external source? Simply because there is a, a power differential mm -hmm. at the top versus the, um, the lower level of okay. the organization. I would encourage you to include uh, boards in your survey. 
also, <laughs> just to, uh, you know, I went to Yale, so I feel like I need to set, the, we need to set the parameters, I need to know how I'm being scored, and how I'm being graded. Uh, I would say uh, nowhere near where we need to be over time, and that time is not a long time from now. We're working really hard on that, and there's so many different dimensions of equity, so I would say Ford is good in terms of having a very, very diverse workforce at all levels of the institution, and that's a strong value and something that we pay a lot of attention to. We are currently, um, we are not an institution that, we are a very hierarchical institution. So power in the sense, a different sense in which you described it, I think very few people in the institution would feel that we weren't a hierarchy. Um, and that starts with the board uh, and is complicated and we're working on that because we take positions sometimes that not every, obviously not every person in the institution agrees with, and so that's a hard thing. We're also a global institution, so we have 10 offices outside of the US, and this period of time has been a really humbling time to understand where the US helps, how the US hurts, um, how deep that is, how long that is, and so we're a great laboratory for doing the kind of work that um, I think needs to be done, and we try to pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, and then we do also very proactively choose for, organizations that are led by um, people of color in our investment policies. We are, as Don was describing, funding diverse managers. We've made a decision to um, take 40% uh, of our grant dollars in any given year, a billion dollars over a five-year period to invest um, in large multi-year multi grants for key organizations that we work with. And over two-thirds of those organizations are led by women and people of color. So. It's a work in progress, but it's a really strong value and something that we have to work on every day and we're way, way not perfect. Um, I'd say by, uh, let's talk about racial, uh, racial diversity. Um, our foundation is a family foundation and the, found the family is overwhelmingly white. Uh, so our board is uh, about 75% white. Um, we have 10 members of the Andrus family on our board out of 13 board members. That is not likely to change very much, um, but the board is you know, very, very devoted to our mission, which is uh, achieving social justice with a focus on racial equity. Um, the staff is about 75% people of color, uh, and even though we don't yet collect data on our grantees, you know, the demographic information about our grantees, we have a very intentional focus on um, supporting organizations that are led by people of color, and we also talk with them about uh, diversifying their ranks. Um, now, I say that even though our numbers may look pretty good, um, I would say that the challenge of really uh, addressing various types of internal equity uh, and opportunity is never done. It's, it's always uh, a continuous process of really trying to educate folks, uh, making sure that our systems are uh, fair and equitable, uh, and um, also really understanding how we can leverage every tool that we have at our disposal, not just our endowment, uh, and like the way we invest our endowments, the way we make our grants, but also how we um, make decisions about spending, vendors, contractors, those types of things. Uh, I'm really trying to pay attention to all that so that we can have uh, more ways to leverage uh, certain resources so we can achieve our goals. Thank you. Um, just on a, on, a, on, a, on a much more micro level, uh, all of you have addressed something that I think those of us who actually, so we're both a granting and an operating foundation. Um, but for those of us who are on the operating side uh, and we're doing important work, your conversation still uh, is important to our work. So if you're in the voting rights space like we are, and we, we, we're dealing with youth voting rights, one of the things that we uncovered in doing this work over the last three years is that the canaries in the coal mine of this space are youth of color and community college youth. And, I th and so we've shifted dramatically so that we focus very much on HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, community colleges, especially in competitive states where the margins are tight. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but 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 just I just want to uh, leave you, yeah. leave you with with two things. One is um, when when we go to Miami Dade uh, College, which is the largest community college, and there are over one hundred and twenty thousand students with virtually no endowment. And you go go back to your reunion 
which we did this year, where the institute has over 25 billion covering 15,000 students. How do, how do you live with yourself? Um, uh, no, 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 I'm talking to them. Um, uh, so, so, so personal story, and, and, and uh, when I was when I was not non-passive, um, there was a time. Uh, this was one, this is a pivotal moment that, that, that I want to leave this section with. Um, I ended up in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, in an elevator at a hotel with just me, Bill Clinton, and one of his guards going up from the first floor to the 13th floor. And I was just so excited and frozen and had no idea what to say to this man. Um, and, um, and the only thing I could say before the elevator doors opened was, can I get a picture? <laughs> I, reg I still regret that to this, to this day. That, and I, pr I promised that I would never let that experience happen to me again. Uh, that I would always have something to say if I ever saw Bill Clinton again or Obama, and certainly the current president. Um, uh, so th those moments aren't wasted. So, so for President Sullivan, forgive me, Ken, hopefully this doesn't lose you your charter. But for President Sullivan, um, when someone comes to you at your institution, our institution, and says, I'm going to give you 150 million or 250 million for the cafeteria, or for single room dorms with double beds or whatever. Um, and you have community colleges in, the, in your, how do you not say, I don't need that. I would love you, let me introduce you to President Y, who is serving 10 times the number of students that I have. Um, uh, that is what uh, going to Yale has taught me and should teach him and us. And I think you guys agree. <laughs> Great. Uh, next section. Much. Uh, next section. Um, given what I just said, how do you decide who you're going to fund? When you have the need is so great, um, and and you want to leverage as much as possible, I'm assuming uh, uh, your, your your philanthropic dollars. What goes into your decision-making matrix, Don? Uh, sure. Um, well, we, um, you know, how many, how many of you are familiar with theories of change? So this is like philanthropic speak. You know, this is something that I learned as a, as a grant seeker, really I'm trying to understand what, make, what makes the grant maker tick. Um, you know, uh, I think as much a, of a knock that that phrase gets and all the kind of strategy development uh, uh, gets, uh, it's actually really important for foundations to really know what they are trying to accomplish um, and then to lay it out really plainly and to show the logic and be able to explain it to people. So um, we do that in all of our programs. Uh, we try to explain. So I'll just um, offer one example. Um, uh, you know, for example, in our inclusive economies program, I'm going to keep using that example so I can go a little deeper on it. Um, you know, we really try to prioritize access to capital uh, for folks and um, as we think about, you know, what are the institutions, what are the organizations that we need to support to make that possible? Um, uh, we have a, an approach that involves us really getting to know the field. First of all, the broader set of issues, uh, the different players, and then to go pretty deep in various communities. A certain foundation focuses on inequality, um, social justice in America's community, so we try to go local and regional. Uh, and um, our board has called this approach a high-touch approach. Um, so you hardly ever see certain foundation program officers like in the office. <laughs> They're fanned out across the country really trying to understand uh, the circumstances uh, and what different organizations are capable of and then you know, make grants based on you know, whether or not um, uh, different organizations fit the theory of change. So it might be, for example, um, if, you're, if you're trying to do access to capital, um, are there organizations, uh, for example, community development financial institutions that are providing low-cost loans to small businesses? Um, are, is there a critical mass of those types of organizations um, that are, you know, 
demonstrating not only financial prowess, but also you know, excellence in providing technical assistance. Um, can we get a critical mass of those types of organizations into our portfolio? And so uh, those are the types of uh, decisions that we make. Um, and it's very much, uh, you know, a kind of a knowledge-based craft. It's also a relationship-based craft. Uh, we tend to stick with grantees for multiple years and not just kind of, you know, go from strategy to strategy. Uh, and that's very hard work. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned in my time in philanthropy, which has been about 12 years now, it's pretty easy just to, like, give, give away money, make grants. It's very hard to make it really count and have impact and be able to demonstrate what that impact is and to be honest if, uh, about failure. If, you, if your um, measures, if your strategies have not lived up to the promise that uh, you initially hoped you had. So uh, that's an example of how we, um, how we do it. Good. I have a tough question for you, but I'll throw it to Hillary. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but you can... can back but but you can but you can but you can backhand it but 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 I like Don a lot, um, uh, but there's a power dynamic at play yeah. in these decision making, totally. and certainly Cerdner has had some power dynamic play out recently in the press, which I'm not going to ask you about. You can ask me about. Okay, Hillary, I'll pass on you for a second. <laughs> uh, so Don, yeah. um, it's it, it hasn't been that easy in in Cerdner and, and and other places to make the shift that you guys have made. And, and there's been a battle, I guess, for the soul of what is social justice um, and, and so forth. So how does that play out in a philanthropic organization? So what Maxim is referring to is, uh, so the Certain Foundation is uh, the foundation that John Andrus established in 1917. It's a very old foundation, one of the first. Um, and John Andrus had a lot of children. There are 500 living descendants, give or take. Uh, and uh, 10 of them are on the CERDA Foundation board. They're 100% supportive of our mission and the work that we do, and there are some that don't agree with the mission. So um, about a year ago, about two dozen went to the press. Yes. <laughs> yes, two days after I became president, suddenly, boom, there was a, a big ruckus about uh, CERDA's mission. Uh, the folks who don't like what CERDA is doing went to the press, uh, got a story in uh, uh, Chronicle of Philanthropy in the Wall Street Journal, um, basically saying John Andrus never would have appreciated the social justice mission, and um, he was capitalist, he was a Republican congressman from New York, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, these are things that a lot of foundations have to, to face. I mean, the Ford Foundation deals with this all the time. I'm not sure about Luce, but uh, um, many foundations deal with this issue of donor intent. Um, and so, you know, I think what one thing that we recognize is that um, uh, what's really critical to foundations like us is, you know, how are we supposed to be governed? What did the original founder say uh, in his or her will? What, you know, what has the board said over the years? Uh, and in all the cases for us, the Certain Foundation, um, we're, you know, following exactly what John Andrus told us to do, which is uh, basically have the foundation run by family members and have complete latitude in terms of selecting what the program can be. Now, it may be embarrassing in the press to have some family members with the, you know, they don't even have the name Andrus, but because it's been six generations, um, to have them complain to the press and be on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, but the fact is we know very solidly that uh, we're following the donor intent um, and the foundation's mission has been, you know, rock solid and, and very slowly evolving over the decades. Um, it was about a decade ago when social justice, the board decided una unanimously to adopt social justice as its focus. Uh, and again, it, it unanimously adopted racial equity within that mission just last year. Um, so how we deal with it is um, just be really transparent about what we do and um, uh, not waver from the mission that the board has asked us to undertake. Good. Yeah. Uh, Hillary. Amazing. Um, so I think that part of what is driving some of the changes has to do with identity. That Don is coming with a rich set of experiences that may not have been available to the foundation prior to Don. Do you think that being as powerful a woman in the spaces you have occupied in this, in philanthropy, has affected it, um, in part because of your identity. And um, 
how much how much of the power dynamics are um, are are affected by who's in the room um, and who's asking for money? And then the last part of that question is. How do you deal with, with then in the context of what you said earlier, which is the tension between systemic problems and charity, yeah. right, or, or symptoms versus source? Yeah. Wow. Um, so, yes, I think my being a woman has obviously affected um, what I do and how I lead. And I very much feel like my job now, especially as a white woman, an older white woman, is to be support for rising people coming up behind me, especially women of color, leaders of color. Um, that's my job. And so I try to really um, spot and support talent in the foundation and to um, create those kinds of opportunities. I think I spent most of my life raising money. Um, I don't really think of myself as a professional person in philanthropy. And that has, that has colored everything about how I think about philanthropy because I spent my life lying about the organization that I led. I lied about the, what it cost to run it. I lied about what it, you know, um, you know if, if someone would just give me a little tiny piece of money, I would thank them, thank them, thank them, and try to do something impossible in a small amount of time with too little resources. So one of the things I've tried the most to do is to really channel that in my various roles in philanthropy. So, um, you know, the Ford Foundation pays 20% overhead. No questions asked on any project grant that we give. And I'm really proud of that. Um, you know, we, we, we are trying to sit with our grantees and ask them, what's on your mind? What keeps you up at night? What's the work you're trying to do? And how can we help you do that work? We're trying to shift our funding so that it is multi-year funding. You know, this build program that I talked about before, the, one of the single most important things about that, even if the size of the money is not as big as we would like it to be, and it doesn't yet go to as many grantees as we would like, and there are not yet as many other foundations that fund in this way, but is the multi-year support. Because what executive director in their right mind can innovate if they raise every dollar, you know, the, the budget goes down to zero again the next year, right, no matter how good you are. So how are you going to hire people? How are you going to innovate? How are you going to pay your people better? Um, so I feel really passionately that it is almost like a philanthropic malpractice that foundations do, don't do that better. I obsess about, <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm trying to use everything I can from my perch to advocate for these kinds of ideas in Ford and outside of Ford. Um, one thing I ask a lot about at Ford is what percentage of our grantees are new every year because there is a kind of privilege that happens where people come in with networks as program officers and they can very easily find themselves funding people that they know already. So at Ford, only 20% of our grantees are new every year. And I'm trying to cause the foundation to just ask, are we okay with that? Is that the right balance for us? We would be, if you were um, arraying on a spectrum, very strategy driven, our own strategy, let's find the grantees to help us work on that strategy versus grantee given, driven. Ford would be on the far side of the grantee um, driven. So well over 50% of our grantees we have funded for, for five years or more, often way longer than that. But what I will find as I look in the proposals is that for many of those grantees, Ford accounts for 30% or more of their budget, especially in our our regional offices, that's a kind of philanthropic malpractice, to be honest, because we have not been trying to help those institutions um, diversify their money. Um, so if we change a strategy or we get a new president or some, you know, we, we disproportionately harm those institutions without, so I think you've, you've, you know, these are all questions about power. It's a reason why it makes me really happy that, that philanthropy is getting the critique it's getting now. Um, First, of course, it should be working to help make sure governments are funded to do their jobs. Um, and it should be held much more accountable for at least doing no harm to the organizations that it funds and, you know, ideally making them stronger, making them more resilient. Um, especially in times like these where we are fighting existential crises and again on the issues that we fund we thought we were done with the voting rights battles you know we were thought we were done with women's rights and abortion now here we are you know like literally fighting the same battles and, and some of the same lawsuits and some of the same places where we thought we once won so one thing you know about power is it doesn't give 
It doesn't give power up easily. And you're always going to have a backlash, even for every win you get. So that makes it especially important for grantees who are closest to the work to be able to be the first movers. When things like that happen, like they're happening now in our country, they they don't need to have to go to foundations with their hats in their hand and say, oh, please, I noticed this new trend. Would you, could you give me some money? They need resources that allow them to move first and move quickly. And we are doing collectively as philanthropy, I think, a really bad job at helping that be more so. And we don't have those conversations enough with each other. I really, really appreciate your honesty. Um, um, my mother, uh, uh, this, this goes to you, Mariko, uh, was, uh, she died last year from the early onset of Alzheimer's. Um, she was uh, Indian and Chinese. And my father is black and white and Native American and lots of other things. Um, but I've never been on a panel that had two Asian American head of foundations. Like that is amazing, folks. Uh, it's just, it's still statistically unlikely. Neither have I. So, and I always felt, if you do my mother, um, she would have been a magnificent head of a foundation because of her unique experiences uh, as a woman, as a woman in an interracial uh, marriage, um, as a woman, uh, as an immigrant, uh, and any other number of, of, of things. Um, because in the course of my life, I haven't met people that, that, who are making decisions, um, whose uh, decisions are informed by any experience. So there are lots of talent, but, 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 but they don't get it, right? And they, th they mean well, but nothing in their experience would, have, would, would, give them, would arm them with how to understand some of, some of this. Uh, um, I'd, I'd like you to, to, to grapple with that in your context, if, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and, 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 and does that in, in, in any way inform change? Do you see a change with what you're bringing to the foundation versus vis-a-vis -vis other people and, and how you're making decisions or how the folks that work for you uh, are making Leaning decisions? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say a couple of things. Um, first, uh, drawing on my experience as the uh, president of a college, um, there is a group of, uh, by somebody's definition, elite liberal arts colleges, um, where the, it's called the Annapolis Group, and the presidents and deans get together once or twice a year and um, just shoot the breeze. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, there was a moment in that convening when uh, one of my now former colleagues, Joanne Berger Sweeney, who's president of Trinity in Connecticut, and I looked across the room, she's African American, and we said, Oh, it's you, and it's me. <laughs> and so we kind of you know, made our way, and we, and we had a, uh, an initial conversation about um, what is that experience like, particularly, and now this is kind of rewinding a little bit to my previous life, but particularly in a moment when identity broadly understood and, the, and um, the question of whose voice and in what venue is very much present on college campuses. So I just also had my reunion, not the same one, but <laughs> I also had my reunion and I gave a, a little talk at the reunion about what it's like to be the, the protestee, right? What it's like to, to be the person as the representative of the institution who's being protested. We can, that's a whole other um, conversation. But so Joanne and I started to talk about actually what that experience is as a person of color when that is the subject. Um, and when you are the person who is fulfilling the role within the institution, and when you get to be a human who had a set of experiences that you can bring to bear, when it's appropriate and not appropriate to do that and so forth. So we started having this conversation and then a range of conversations around that. And I, I won't um, quote Joanne, she can speak for herself. But uh, one of the things that we did is we actually went, so this is when I was a grantee, uh, a supplicant. <laughs> I went, we went to the Mellon Foundation together. Um, this was a couple of years ago and we said- Before Elizabeth or- Before Elizabeth, oh. yeah, so when Earl was president. And we said, um, look, we, we did a little count, and of all the Mellon-funded institutions um, that we could find that are four-year institutions, um, there are whatever the number was, and there are now more than there were when Joanne and I spied each other across that room, including research institutions, big public universities, et cetera. There were, I think at the time, 13 of us 
who were women of color who were presidents. And now we're talking of, as of whatever, somebody who's better at math than I can, um, can do the percentage, but out of small, small thank you. <laughs> so Tiny. we said, you have, a, you have a nice room, feed us dinner, host a dinner. And they did. Uh, so they hosted us for dinner. Um, Janetta Cole, who uh, those of you who are familiar with higher ed will know is like truly the grand dam, uh, was the president of Spelman and the president of Bennett and, and many other things besides. She was our, our sort of MC slash facilitator um, and Mellon supported us to have this conversation. Um, we have since kind of grown that conversation into uh, a, a, a hopefully a bigger conversation, a multi-sector conversation, uh, where we want to get women of color together to talk about who lead, who are the, the face of an organization, not just the manager of the organization, the face of the organization to talk about what that experience is because it is different. Um, it's a whole other pan about to talk about all the ways in which it's different, but it is different. Um, and also different for me than it is for Joanne, than it was for Janetta, certainly. Um, and to really think together about what that means about, does it matter that we're here? Why and how does it matter that we're here? Not just for us, and not just for the public facing um, signaling value. But how do we think different? Exactly this question, how do we think differently? And can we share some of the ways in which we think we think differently about the work that we do because of the experiences that we've had, all of which are, are incredibly diverse and very different across all of our uh, all of our lives. Is this what Elizabeth calls the sister presidents group? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it, it is the sister presidents group. That's right. That's, That's right. fantastic. So that, that is Janetta's uh, Janetta's uh, uh, great term. And I will say, anytime Janetta would call me up and say, "Sister president." <laughs> Like, oh my God, Janetta just <laughs> called me her sister. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, so yes, that is the sister president's group. Well, there's a little brother who wants to join <laughs> some dinner. Yes, and we did actually have a conversation about, you know, what about the men? Um, and the first conversation was, let's have, like, there are things, let's just recognize that there are things that we can say and, um, and perhaps shoot the breeze about that are just different and can have a different kind of vibe of That's conversation. And we also have to have the, the other conversation. Thank you. Especially gay men. Anyway, <laughs> um, questions? Yes, sir. For us, yes, absolutely. I think individuals with disability are where multiple inequalities concentrate here in the US and all around the world. Um, Darren has been very public about his own blind spot about that issue, and we have worked really hard as an institution to begin to change that in ways we're um, really proud of. But it's, it's, it's a hugely important issue that gets too little attention. Yes. Someone? Raise their hands here. Oh, yes. Sorry. Hi. Alicia Lee from TIAA. Um, this question is uh, on the back of one of the comments you made, Hillary. Um, and I would like if everyone could comment on this. Um, to this point about how difficult it is for new prospective grantees to kind of get into the mix, I just would love to hear your perspectives on maybe some best practices you've seen or some do's and don'ts you would think about when it comes to a new prospective grantee trying to kind of cold um, email or approach yeah. a grantor. What are some graceful ways you've seen that done and just kind of that, you know, that relationship begin to be built? One second, Hillary. Not so graceful. Before you answer, one best practice <laughs> is to make sure they remember your name. What's your name? What's your name? Okay. Yes, yes. Oh, oh, I Aisha Lee, and, and you're a TIA, yeah. a, and I was remiss. Everyone should give the names because you should never leave a gathering on which people don't remember you. So it's not gonna be so cold when you send the email. Well, think how, <laughs> more, think how mortifying it is the way you started this panel with me, that you called to try to talk to me and I, for five minutes. And I would, <laughs> so I think one of the things that's really hard is especially now with email and all of things being searchable, People in foundations are at the receiving end of an unbelievable amount of requests, and most of what they do is say no. Um, so I think for, for a, 
a grantee that's trying to break through that wall, which is really daunting, um, you have to have a quick, a quick way of you have to you have to have done some homework, and I'm surprised at how at how often people really haven't. So homework enough about the foundation to know how best to position what you do to be aligned with the foundation's mission and interests and, and curiosity, and then you know shorter is better. One of the most painful things is when a new um, grantee or prospective grantee comes; um, they talk the whole time. And so they don't take, you know, so whatever the minute, five minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, um, you know, I think if they could take the, the rule, you know, talk a third of the time, get the other person to talk two thirds of the time, they would learn so much more about the foundation and the foundation would um, feel like it had established more of a relationship with them. But people are so anxious to tell you every single thing about what they do. And it's really painful to be on the receiving end of that because you feel disrespectful if you try to stop it or interrupt it. And so I, I, I work really hard and I try to have the people that I work with figure out um, empathetic ways to, to interrupt that, you know, to kind of stop that and to try to put the grantee at their ease and to get them to talk about the things that, you know, are why they're in the work and what's hard um, in their organization. But it is really hard to get into the door of foundations. and. It's a messed up thing because um, they have money and nonprofits need money. So those would be some. But you know, bet, I, I think I have very little to recommend on the best practice at the front end of penetrating and more about what happens when you get the meeting. But I think that you know, to do that um, work. And then on the, our receiving end, we, I, we try, I try to um, respond to an email within 24 hours, even if I know that I can't meet the person. I try as best as I can to say I was a grant seeker and one of the things I learned the hard way was um, I wish people had just told me no more quickly so that I didn't spend my time trying to get a meeting that it was never gonna happen. Um, and I, I try to offer that as respectful to the person. I doubt that they that, that really feels very good, but I'm surprised at how often I get a response that just says thank you for that. So, but it's a, it's a really messed up imbalance. No two ways around it. Yes. Could you tell me your name, please? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I do think that is a way in which uh, both individual donors. So now we're here talking about philanthropy, but a lot of this money is individual donors and donor advised funds, which are another complicated beast. Um, but uh, sh the short answer is yes. I think that's one of the ways in which we should use our voice and the power that comes with sitting on a pile of money. One more question? Okay, yeah, yes, orange. That's you. Yes. <laughs> I could take a crack at that. Uh, so different foundations have different processes. Some are aware and some are less aware of um, how their processes might, for example, reinforce inequality. 
Um, I think we, like, like a lot of foundations, really try to take that into consideration. Uh, for example, there are a lot of organizations that have professional staff people who spend their entire career writing grant proposals. And if, if you're interested in funding community-based organizations like we are that, that have a racial equity focus in low-income communities, it's very likely that these organizations won't have a professional uh, fundraiser. And so we take that into consideration. Um, you know, there, there's actually a, a pretty um, uh, a burgeoning um, consciousness within philanthropy uh, to try to make things easier for grantees. So Hillary referred to some of those practices. Um, other practices are, for example, allowing grantees to submit uh, a proposal that was written, for example, for another foundation. Um, you know, lessening the requirements uh, of reporting. Um, one thing that really bugged me when I was a, a grant seeker was sending the, the funder <laughs> a grant report that they didn't seem to ever read mm -hmm. or like, you know, provide, providing data that they didn't seem to need. So, um, you know, that, like lessening the burden on stuff that is unnecessary uh, is, is a really key thing. The other thing I'll say is that um, we do have a program uh, called the Andrews Family Fund uh, which um, r uh, receives letters of inquiry and then reads every single letter, assesses everything based on a set of criteria. That, that program has become so well known that now we're getting like 700 a year and it's becoming overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so as much as we do to try to um, address some of the inequalities through these techniques that I mentioned, um, at a certain point, like just our staff capacity is so limited that uh, we may have to change that and just stop, you know, accepting just like every blind uh, letter of inquiry that we receive and, and think about how to, how to request proposals in a different way. So it is a continual challenge. And I know Ford has had to grapple with different ways of receiving um, applications as well. And, you know, practically every foundation has to do that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to the final section of tonight's conversation. Um, and I'm very thirsty. Um, so earlier tonight, I don't know if this happened to you guys, uh, Mariko and I were sitting in the front row before we were called up here, and they came and took our water. Uh, I'm not sure if that was sort of the trying to balance the equality scale, because some people don't have water, um, but, you know, but it would be really good to have some water. Um, just in case anyone is listening, <laughs> it's not a metaphor. Or it's not a metaphor or anything. A lot of folks in, 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 in the room tonight uh, really would like to know how one gets into the philanthropic space actually may get employed by a foundation um, or head a foundation. Um, and I would love it, uh, especially for those of us who are more ordinary than the three of you, um, uh, if, if you could tell us a little bit about your journey, um, but also, uh, uh, is, is it, how impossible is it uh, for regular folks? To say that Yaleys can be regular folks um, to break into this space. Mariko, start with you. Because none of us here, uh, Hillary, were you a president of a college? No. Anyone else here is a president of a college? One, okay. So, in CUNY. In CUNY, all right, all right, all right. So you have a sister, but besides her, how do we do it? Um, so those are two separate questions uh, because the track to being a college president traditionally is very can be different uh, from uh, the track to being the head of a foundation. Um, I would say a couple of things. Um, one is, if you want to be a college or university president, you probably need to get a PhD. We can debate whether that's good or bad or indifferent, but it, it is. Um, the way that these jobs get filled almost always is by a search firm. Um, so the advice that I give to everyone is, 
If for whatever reason you're in a position to get to know a search firm, do it. You don't have to be looking. Don't do, and I will just say this, women do this in my experience more than men. The search firm calls and they say like, oh, I'm not really looking and I don't want my boss to think I'm trying to you know, get out of here and so I'm not even going to talk to them. Or if I talk to them, the first thing out of my mouth is like, I'm not interested, uh, but can I help you? Talk to the search firm take the meeting, take the call, try to get them to take you to lunch, like the, because then they know you, and then the next time around, or the third next time around, you're gonna be in their Rolodex. Um, I always also try to be the most, and Marilyn's not here anymore, but the most helpful person a search firm person has ever met. So, even if I'm not interested, who are the other people I wanna lift up into their network? Um, who are the people I want them to know about? Do I have an opportunity to shape the way that they think about the kind of person they're looking for for that job? And can I do that in a way that's going to lift up particularly people who might not otherwise be on their radar, either as individuals or as a profile? Um, and I think that's all of our obligation because we're the ones who get the calls. And if you get the call, yes, yay. <laughs> <laughs> rule break. Start by breaking the rules. No, it's okay. All right, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you definitely take it. Um, so the, 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 the mechanics of it are it's search firms. Take the call. Talk to the search firm. Even maybe reach out to somebody and say, hey, you know, you don't know me, but at some point I might want to get into philanthropy. I don't know if you have any jobs now, but could I take you to lunch if you're in a position to do that? And just pick your brain because then they will know you, and if they don't know you, they will not call you. That's great advice. I think in um, in philanthropy, it's really hard to get a to to get a job in philanthropy. So the thing that I I think is the most successful for people, especially people who want to come to to start early in their careers, which and then hope that they can get a career ladder in philanthropy, that's ex exceedingly rare. So you're much much better off um, working in a grantee kind of organization, a nonprofit, and becoming in some way either a thought leader or a practice leader in that space and having relationships with people in foundations who come to know you as that kind of a thought leader or a practice leader. And that is nine times out of 10, the ways in which people move into more senior positions in philanthropy, they don't move up from within. And I, you know, those are uh, great pieces of advice. I appreciate the question. Um, when I was, uh, you know, when I started my career, I worked for nonprofits primarily and you know, initially I didn't really know what a foundation was. I mean, I kind of had a vague sense because of the branding that you hear on public radio and whatnot, but um, didn't really know what a foundation was uh, until I had to actually raise money. Um, and if I had known, like I started an organization when I was pretty young, if I had known, if I could talk to my you know, 28 year old self uh, about how to go about raising money and talking to foundations, um, I would have so much to tell this young man. Um, and so I appreciate the question because I think it's really important to understand how foundations work. Um, you can actually get a lot of exposure to that through uh, the ways in which um, uh, Hillary and Mariko uh, describe. Uh, even um, you know, working at a government agency that has competitive grants, you know, helps you understand the grant making process. Working in a nonprofit, talking with the development folks, if there is a development person and becoming one yourself is another great way to do it. And then you know, really building that experience like you say, as a, as a practice leader, a thought leader, um, is one way to really you know, get noticed and potentially enter into that space. Um, I don't necessarily think that you have to work in the philanthropic sector to gain a lot of the skills and the knowledge about how to navigate uh, that world. Uh, you know, I think you can, you can do it through a lot of different ways. And, um, uh, but you know, primarily talking to people, really understanding, being curious, about how different foundations do it, uh, I think that's a really critical thing. Thank you. I made a promise. Um, what was your name? Uh, Jana. 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 From, as in Jana? <laughs> oh, all right. And where are you from? I'm from, I work with Fifth Avenue Finance. And you want a grant? No, no, I'm trying, I'm here for a client of mine. Ah. Okay. Well, I, c I can't help unless you were doing student activism and around or activities fund. Right <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Thank you. Thanks for for the water. Uh, we need people to carry our water a lot. Jan, I will remember it. Yeah.
right? I'll remember it. Um, uh, uh, Don, you raised something really interesting uh, that I think took me a, a long time to understand. So um, can you guys uh, help us figure out what are the um, interplay between the philanthropic sector, the for-profit sector, and the government sector? Are you doing things differently? Is there overlap, um, or is it exactly the same? Oh gosh, there there are so many ways in which the different sectors can work together. Yes, yes. we could we could go and <laughs> we could we could go till twenty twenty one talking right, about this. Right, right. Um, but uh, do you want examples, or how do you want to do it? Well, just briefly, because I I, I think some people uh, don't, just don't understand what what the divisions are. So I've worked in state government, I've worked in the federal government, uh, I've worked in uh, higher ed, uh, nonprofit sector, and then in philanthropy. Uh, and I can tell you they're, they're certainly enormously different. Um, I think actually the biggest difference that is underappreciated is the difference between working in state government. Uh, I've not worked in city government, uh, but state government and working in the federal government. Uh, I think we tend to think of and talk about government in this country like it's all one big lump, um, but it's really not. Um, so I think that's the, the single biggest distinction. Uh, I think in terms of the, um, the roles that, that each entity can play, even within the, and again, like we haven't had dinner yet at 830, mm -hmm. but even within the federal government uh, and within state governments, you have people who are civil, civil servants and you have people who are political appointees. We're seeing very starkly in this administration um, how, that, uh, how that can shake out. Um, so I would say it's, it's even within those subsectors more complicated and your position within those entities makes a big difference in terms of what you can accomplish um, and in what areas you can accomplish it. Um, and then I would say too, the, there is a um, there are subsector differences in in higher ed certainly um, yes community colleges as was mentioned but also the difference between publics and privates and being at a um, at a research institution and a and a not research focused institution um, but I think the biggest difference in the lived experience of the day to day is the difference between being in a public institution and a private nonprofit institution. Um, so for those of you who've not experienced FOIA, for example, like uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act is, a, is an incredibly important thing and it drives a lot of decision making in public institutions about what gets talked about. Um, and the biggest, for having been in all those different sectors, the biggest transition for me was from public to private. No, okay. Um, I think, you know, uh, thinking about your question, um, I really appreciate that one too, because I think that uh, it, it also signals an opportunity for foundations and folks in other sectors to be creative. Uh, there are all kinds of partnerships that you can form, whether it's, you know, through public uh, agencies or through the private sector. Um, and what I do find is that, you know, you know so often people in the philanthropic sector don't reach out to folks in other sectors. Um, but uh, you know some of the most innovative, really you know interesting uh, initiatives that I've that I've been involved in or that I've seen have really involved folks working across sectors and and figuring out what piece of what they can bring to the table can can add value. Um, and uh, you know one example is the way financial institutions have worked with um, foundations. Uh, you know in terms of let's say affordable housing. Um, you know, there, there are players in private sector roles uh, that can really help advance the public interest if they have a little incentive or maybe you're, uh, you know, one of the things that foundations do well is de-risk deals, especially financing deals. And so, like, if a, fin uh, a foundation can come in and de-risk something by doing loan guarantees or, you know, providing subordinate debt or something like that, then it's much more likely to create a safer environment for, you know, someone from the private sector to come in. So. Lots of creative things, and um, I would encourage you know all of you to think about like how how can we do this a little bit differently and uh, and pair up with folks that we normally don't work with. Thank you. So very rapidly, because you kept hearing, I'm being reminded it's 8:30. Uh, any quick career questions that you guys want to ask? Okay, so there's time to mingle after. Um, oh, there is. Oh, I'm blind. Sorry. Go ahead.
New York City. I'm from Bank Island originally. And I guess I uh, work in a nonprofit healthcare uh, that I work with my friends since since, uh, since college, and I'm working full time now. Um, I guess my question is, what would you advise someone like me uh, who is still working at, you know, I'm working in a nonprofit that also works for different kinds of options um, to see where I can make the most impact, uh, not only within the US, but also internationally. What would be your advice? I think, I think you're in an, if you have a passion for healthcare, you're in an amazing field, and you're in a field that is perfect for public-private um, kinds of partnership. So I think to pay attention to where you think um, the innovation is happening that you believe in, right? Uh, and to try to become expert on those kinds of issues. And it might be that you end up working in a for-profit startup or, or a big insurance company. It might be that you go into government. But I, I think um, following the thing you love that makes you curious, and it's hard when you start in the nonprofit sector because you aren't paid what you're worth. And so I think everybody has to think about that and, and know when they will, you know, when and if they feel like they need to make a kind of shift. But I don't think, um, I think you're in a, in a really incredible field for being of service to humanity where innovation is really needed and it's coming from all the, from every sector. So I think I, my advice would be to um, really pay a lot of attention to innovations that you respect and then figure out how to make yourself useful in those. And, and from informational interviews, as you just described, is a, is a really smart thing to do, including when you have a job. You know, because you might say, I'm trying to figure out this problem in the organization that I'm in, and would you give me 15 minutes of your time to get smarter? Um, so that would be my advice. Yeah, and just uh, to, your, to your question, too, I think um, there's the experience that, that Hillary described of being talked at. The meeting that most people are, I think, most likely to take is the, can I just have a few minutes of your time? I have a question rather than like girding yourself for the pitch session, mm -hmm. right? If, but especially, not only, um, but especially if you're um, on the younger side, I think most people will be very generous with their time to help and support, and not only if you're on the younger side, but help and support and help you think through something, and people are eager to do that um, more so. And so that, and, and if you're authentic and honest and not lying <laughs> about it, um, you, which we've all done, um, I think, uh, people will make a connection with you, and that connection can then in the future, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point lead to a receptiveness uh, to a, a grant conversation that maybe, maybe it's the thing that you bring, maybe it's something that the two of you develop together, but it means that you're in conversation and you're engaging the mind and not just the pocketbook of the person who you're talking to, and the same would go for you. And I think I'll also address Aisha's question and Shogun's question um, by saying that um, just to add to the comments that have already been made, uh, the one thing that really um, makes me notice someone is when they really have, have done their reading, if they've really taken the time to understand what you know, my foundation um, and our programs actually do. Uh, and so that, that goes a long way. If, uh, and then you can get, have a conversation that's more grounded in something that I can actually you know, talk about. Um, so that's really key. Um, just to answer your question, I get this question a lot. I, we have a very young staff, and so a lot of people who are at the beginning of their careers and they're thinking about, um, you know, what their next steps might be, even after like three or four or five years at CERDNA, um, what I tell every single one of them is, is two things. Number one is what Hillary said, um, which is, you know, really be curious, do informational interviews, find out about how, you know, the world works in different institutions and whatnot. The second thing is um, do an exceptionally uh, good job at your current job. Like really uh, excel and focus on that job. Um, I think too often I have like you know younger cousins and nieces and nephews who really want to aim for something higher, and they're not really focused on their current job. So um, you know focus on that. No one can take that away from you if you really do you know excellent work. That's something that you can always have, and hopefully it will pave the way for you to go other places. Right. Which also means you'll have great references, which in the end also is the key. <laughs> right. Um, so I want to, to close um, and, and take a point of privilege. Uh, 
so so we are living in um, a, a, a very a crisis moment in American history and probably world history beyond climate um, be, uh, because of the top and, and that's why we have the topic of this conversation which is about uh, inequality and the role of philanthropy in helping uh, counter it um, and when, when you're thinking about uh, how much money is diverted away from the public coffers uh, to these philanthropic organizations um, with a belief that they can help the public good. And I think we have to challenge that, not just accept that's the way it should be, but challenge that to say, are they really fulfilling the mission, the reason we have a structure that diverts all this money? Are they really helping us solve our problems with inequality? Um, and, and, and so, uh, I'd love you guys to close with, with, are you, do you believe you are truly moving the needle, um, on helping us solve the problem of inequality? Uh, while you think about that, um, I want to introduce you to someone, uh, because I think, uh, ev a lot of us are, are, uh, sacrificing, uh, for this belief that we can help uh, make the world a better place. And some of us have done that with our lives. And I always take a moment when we have such a, a person uh, uh, or, uh, or a family in, in, in the audience. Um, so I'm, I'm the managing director of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. And for those of you who don't know, Andy Goodman was 20 years old when he volunteered to in, uh, during Freedom Summer uh, 1964. He was a, a privileged white Jewish guy from New York and traveled to Mississippi, where he and two other young men uh, were killed on their first day by white supremacist terrorists, otherwise known as the, as the Ku Klux Klan. And it is his death uh, and his co-workers uh, that really uh, catalyzed a movement in this country uh, that in less than a year we got to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that moment inspired his mom and dad to create this foundation in 1966. And David Goodman, his brother, is here with us tonight. So, so David, would you stand and let us thank you for all the work. Um, and so I am busy trying to divert the Goodman money to do good work, uh, to carry on uh, Andy's legacy uh, of trying to address fundamental notions of fairness and inequality in our democracy. So starting with Mariko and ending with Don, are you helping us move the needle on this fundamental question? Let's say in some ways, yes, and in many ways, I don't know. Um, uh, there are a couple of programs that I can point to where I think we really are moving the needle, particularly as it relates to whose voice is at the table, who gets to, not just who gets to be at the table, but who gets to have a voice at the table, who gets to frame the question in the first place, who gets to help us to think about what kind of society we want to be, um, and how do we lift up, um, yes, underrepresented voices, and um, voices that might not have access, uh, whether they uh, look underrepresented or not, and to do that in partnership with communities. So we have a program uh, where we partner with the First Nations Development Institute um, to support uh, ind indigenous knowledge makers and uh, very deliberately decided that we are not in a position to make the decision ourselves about whose voice should be at the table, but there are communities that we want to support. We don't go into that with a theory of change, and you know, we can uh, talk about um, uh, what that means to different people, uh, but instead we really want to be community-led, and our job is to provide the resources. Our job is not to provide the framing of the question or the decision or the end point. Um, so I think there are some areas in which we are doing that, and there are a lot of areas in which we've not asked the question. Thank you. Hillary? I don't know, and I hope so. Um, I, I think the one benefit that we have is we, we can take the long road. Um, that means we should take risks, and we should um, really reach out to include and lift up people that would not otherwise be. So um, 
you know, what we are trying to do is to center, is, is to change who's at the table and to center their voices and to link them with each other. You know, social movement activists from across the world with each other. Um, and to know that, you know, that kind of movement energy is something that's really important. That's making us have to change a lot because a lot of people who are creating important movements don't ever want to form an organization um, and are and really believe in, in leader full uh, kinds of different leadership models. So we're learning a lot as we do that. But um, I'd say that for most of us, we are haunted every day by not knowing. Don? You know, when you open up the panel, you talked about the billions of dollars, and I, I do, you know, not to be cliched, but like I think of Spider-Man, and I think, you know, with great billions, there comes a lot of responsibility, and great responsibility, and, um, and I, I, I say that in, in all seriousness, because I, 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 I do agree with the framing that you offered in the beginning, which is, you know, there's an opportunity cost here, um, and it's a public policy, so at one level, it's a public policy question, you know, are our tax laws the way they should be, you know, should we get, be giving this preferential tax treatment to institutions like ours? Um, and so that's that's a whole nother conversation. There are books about that, and that's a whole nother Yana panel. Um, and I think it's great that we're having that debate in this country right now. Um, as for our individual institutions, you know, it's an incredible privilege to run an organization that has a mission that is really trying to move the needle on these different issues. I also don't know, and I hope so, um, that we are moving the needle. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at the broader philanthropic sector, a relatively small proportion of foundations actually do what we do, which is, you know, get out there, talk about what we do, um, you know, put stuff on our website, um, and really try to demonstrate uh, how we're making good use of this public trust. Um, a huge proportion of foundations don't do that. And so, um, you know, I think as we try to you know, constantly grapple with this challenge, um, uh, I'm hoping that we, we can advance things, you know, be able to get people excited about the work that we're doing, um, you know, whether you're working on civil rights and voting rights or on income inequality or various things, so that they do take the challenge. And I see that as part of our role. Like if we can't demonstrate that we've made a difference, we've moved the needle, and then inspire some other folks who have you know, wealth uh, to do similar things within this current policy context, then, then I think we've failed in, in uh, uh, the task that we have. So that's how I look at it. Thank you. Amazing panel, Mariko, <laughs> Hillary, and Don. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for hosting this panel. And uh, I feel incredibly pr privileged to have entertained you tonight. Uh, thank you very much.